Okay, welcome back from lunch. I hope you're full. Our next talk is not quite de-specific, but it's uh, the, first the first part, sorry. The first part's not quite de-specific, um, but it should be an intriguing talk. It's related to, uh, how many of you have uh, listened to the podcast he, he published recently? A few of you, okay. All right, so this talk is sort of a continuation from that. So, uh, Luis Marquez. Thank you. Okay, so this is about programming in D in a way that's not uh, quite object-oriented, but it's very related. Let me just give you a quick update. So last year I presented the HDL, and it had a library part and a compiler part, which wasn't implemented, so you had to manually convert it to true D. And I now have a very rough proof of concept uh, transpiler that compiles the simpler circuits to D. And I'm working on integrating it better with the rest of the language without requiring a full D compiler, which would be insane. And one reason why the progress has been a bit more slow to come is that my original plan wasn't to do the, the HDL first, but to do a digital logic simulator that I call symbol first. But I really wanted to, to do it in a clean way, but I was confused about good architecture. I'm not confused anymore, so let me talk to you about this. So to clarify first, I really should say that I really have no intrinsic a priori preference for in favor of OOP or against OOP. I just want to come up with good solutions to programming problems and give me feedback. I'm really ready to change my mind. Uh, I don't really have a home team. I also want to stress that this is not a personal attack on anyone. So uh, bad code, in my opinion, it's not a personal failing. And hopefully, because I've produced a lot of bad code myself, I really wouldn't want to be judged by it. And maybe in a week, I have a completely different opinion anyway. Uh, but I think that, in general, OP is not right, because it's not right in its most general application. So, for instance, an aspirin cures everything. It's wrong because it isn't always right. Uh, it's still the right treatment some, sometimes, and OP is the right treatment for some of our uh, problems. But in my opinion, it's not always the correct solution. And the problem is that we don't really have a good theory of when OOP should apply and not. I at least haven't seen any good one put forth. And that's a problem. In fact, I have some experience understanding how people reason about in favor and against OOP because over the years, I've read most of the articles that are linked in like uh, Hacker News and Reddit talking about this. And I actually went to the effort of reading the comments. So I know the kinds of arguments that people use to promote or defend or uh, contradict object-oriented programming. So for instance, here's a typical argument. The problem with object-oriented languages is that they've got all this implicit environment that they carry around with them. You wanted a banana, but what you got was a gorilla holding the banana in the entire jungle. And OK, this is... This is rather funny, but the problem is, it, is this true? I don't know. And worse, even if this is true, maybe this is just an accidental fact of the way that we have written our languages, our libraries, and maybe there isn't anything, a necessary consequence of object-oriented programming that has to make this true. But if we really understand object-oriented programming, we should be able to answer these questions. And then people might say things like, sure, OP might not be appropriate for everything, but you really want it for GUIs or something else. But then you have questions like, what about, for instance, React? Isn't that uh, something that's not quite object-oriented? And if, any, uh, if it were the case, uh, what properties of OP do you need? Do you need every property of OP, or are there some more specific properties that you could use in other paradigms to achieve your objectives. And another argument might be 
Sure, OP might not be worth it for small projects, but when you have these large projects with all of this complexity, you really need OP to tackle the complexity. But for me, this isn't clear that it's true because why can't you decompose your very large problem into smaller problems and then maybe use some other tools to attack each of those smaller problems? And related questions like, what exactly is the size at which OP really starts to become mandatory? I sometimes also see people like moving the goalposts, so it's be something like this. In 1988, Alice is very excited about Visual Basic 6. It's like, wow, now it's even object-oriented. But Bob is kind of a skeptic of Visual Basic. He's like, nah, VB6 doesn't have inheritance. For OP, you need polymorphism, inheritance, and encapsulation. But then the clock moves, and it's 2018, and Alice has changed her mind. He's like, oh, OP sucks. Inheritance causes lots of problems. But then Bob the Wise, he says, ah, yes, everybody knows you should prefer composition over inheritance. It's not my fault if you don't practice OP correctly. Hmm. Kind of moving the goalposts here. So let's talk OP. What is it? I think there are some properties that aren't fundamental, things like classes and does inheritance, while some other properties have to do about what objects are that are very fundamental, namely messaging and encapsulation. And you can see this, for instance, in this drawing of the Objective-C manual, where they draw the data encapsulated around this border, and you send messages with, between the objects, and they invoke methods, and it's the methods that actually manipulate the data. So what could be the problem with this? Nothing. There isn't any problem with objects because they are just a concept like an integer or red or love. But the actual problem is that people have very specific ideas of how we should go about using objects to solve actual programming problems. And that's where my differing opinion comes in. You probably already know the joke of the hotel fire where you have an engineer, a physicist, and a mathematician. And a small fire breaks out in the corridor. And the engineer, he goes back to his room, does some calculations on a napkin, and he throws out the exact amount of water to put out the fire. Uh, was that the engineer or the physicist? The physicist goes, he turns on the, the, the sink and floods the fire with water and goes back to sleep completely rested, not worried about the fire. But then comes the mathematician, he looks at the fire, he goes back to his room, does lots of proofs, lemmas, and long chains of reasoning, and in the end he's like, I've got it, I know there is a solution to putting out the fire. He goes back to sleep without putting out the fire. <laughs> and I think this sometimes happens to us, to all of us. We have these ultimate goals like, features, performance, and security, like Walter talked about. And these are the things that we really want. But then we have all of these mechanisms to achieve those goals. Things like encapsulation, tests designed by contract, type checking. But it doesn't end there, because then you have mechanisms to achieve those mechanisms, like member functions, continuous integration service, assertion, subtyping. So you start to have these long reasonings where you kind of lose track of what your ultimate goal is. So you start doing mistakes. For instance, Scott Myers has an article about how people use member functions to achieve encapsulation, to achieve flexibility and robustness, so that they can bring the bacon home. But he argues that no, member functions actually make the code less encapsulated, even though people believe that in object-oriented, that means putting the functions inside the classes. That's what encapsulation is all about. So we see here that there was a flaw in this reasoning, and in fact, non-member functions improve encapsulation. But we could think, OK, there are all of these chains of reasoning. Maybe we, there are other completely different alternatives, like non-member functions and partners abstract interfaces, or pure functions and functional programming, all to achieve our ultimate goals. So this is the, the kind of problems that happen, is that 
when we want to achieve our goals, sometimes these very superficial objections get thrown at us, like, ah, oh, you aren't doing test-driven design, or that's not object-oriented, you aren't following the rational process. And sometimes people have lost track of how, in what way exactly, those mechanisms would contribute to, to our ultimate goals. So this is the, the approach that we are going to see in this talk today, is that we have these possible contradictions uh, we are going to try to understand them and solve them. So let me give you an example just to clarify the overall mechanism that we are following here. You are professional programmers, so you know that you shouldn't put comments in your codes that are very superficial, that don't have useful information. So, of course, if you write goals plus plus, that increases the number of goals. You shouldn't put that, it's noise. You should instead if anything, write things that aren't clear in the code itself, like that the goals and the points are related to each other some other way. But then if you have this rule that you shouldn't document the obvious, then you might wonder, well, I have this swap function, and it says that it swaps the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Isn't this violating our earlier, earlier rule? And we might say yes or no, we might say, you know, in this context, it might be worth it to be very explicit, to have this extra redundancy, because this is in the context of documentation. But in any case, we have this opportunity to refine the rules that we were considering, that we thought were absolute, but actually they are more nuanced. So the question is, you are not actually swapping them. Well, this is a code excerpt. Yeah, but if I don't need to see the code. If the, this is the signature, you're not swapping LHS and RHS. You need ref. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, I, it's, I, a, it's good to have to do the documentation so that you know this is a bug. <laughs> now, you see, this works for classes. <laughs> and it swaps something internal. Uh, I probably, in the hurry, tried to simplify the documentation so it wasn't lots of code, and I became overzealous with deleting code. But thanks. <laughs> uh, so we talked about all of these very superficial arguments against and in, in favor of object-oriented programming. And I was deeply unsatisfied with how illuminating they were until I read one article that I realized, ah, there's actually something very fundamental here. And uh, in one of the Silicon Valley D meetup talks that I was invited, I decided I wanted to talk about that because I thought it was something so interesting. And I'm just going to give you a very brief uh, overview of that uh, presentation here. And the general idea was this. I presented the rich domain models which are basically the normal object-oriented way of doing things against the anemic domain modules, which are a more procedural or functional approach. And um, generally, the, the rich domain model uh, is the way that you want. So I present an example of playing the Monopoly game. And in Monopoly, we have things like players and properties in the bank. So if you want to do something like the player buys a property, the usual object-oriented way of doing it is that the player has a by-property method. So I presented the code for that, and it's kind of straightforward. Here, this is very simplified. And then I asked questions like, uh, given these things that we want to do, such as buying a house, we have all of these very complicated rules that we know that we want to check and implement. Like, if a player owns Baltic Avenue, can the player add a house to it? We have to be able to answer a lot of questions like, can she afford it? Is there a house in the bank? Is it either the player's turn or between turns? Does the property already have four houses because of hotels? Is Baltic Avenue mortgaged? What if Mediterranean Avenue, which is a property in the same group, is mortgaged? And so on. And when you go implement this problem in the obj usual object-oriented way, and you try to address all of those concerns, what often end up, ends up happening is that we have these fat objects that know a lot of stuff, uh, they touch a lot of other objects, they don't, they don't have a single responsibility. 
In alternative, I presented the anemic domain model approach, which was the more procedural approach. And here, what I try to emphasize is that uh, using the service layer uh, anti uh, classes, you could have classes that have a single responsibility. So, for instance, a buy house class could know everything about the rules, uh, the mechanics of buying a house, and it actually delegated uh, the exact validation of those rules to another class, a house purchase, val purchase validator, which, whose single responsibility was checking that you were in the state of being able to buy a house. And you had code for that. And the conclusion of that meetup is that against the usual uh, preconceived notions, in my opinion, and in the opinion of, of some people uh, that had wrote the material upon which I had based that talk, uh, the anemic approach allowed you to have a better separation of concerns, and even interesting, uh, it allowed you to have improved reusability, which is very strange because wasn't it object-oriented that pro promised you that we are going to have reusability and you could just match up objects that someone had already coded? But here it was the anemic approach that wasn't really object-oriented in the usual sense that had increased reusability and it was easier to test and so on. Uh, as Mike was saying, I really don't have the time to do justice to this material here and I knew I was, com I was going to completely botch here uh, trying to present it like five or ten minutes. So I uh, try to record this explanation in more detail uh, and I produced this podcast episode so that uh, you, have, uh, you can follow along the argument in a bit more clear way. So what was then the contradiction here? When I presented the meetup, on the surface, the contradiction was between the rich domain model, which was the usual object-oriented way of doing it, and the single responsibility principle. Because we saw that to get the single responsibility principle, we had to go to the anemic approach, which wasn't really OOP. And therefore, we concluded that we couldn't have both of these principles, and that violates the assumptions that most people have. Also, the same thing with reusability. But I think this was a kind of a superficial conclusion, and let me explain why. Uh, there's this thing in logic called the principle of explosion, which is that if you start with an assumption that is contradictory, you can come up through this chain of reasoning, uh, you can conclude anything. So from P and not P, you can conclude an unrelated Q. And here, I think that might have happened. So for instance, roses are red and roses are not red, if I believe those things at the same time, I can conclude something completely unrelated, like ham is tasty. And so we had a problem that we had concluded that we couldn't have both the single responsibility principle and rich domain models. But I think maybe the problem was somewhere upstream in some assumptions that we had made. So what's the fundamental problem with object-oriented programming? I don't think there is one answer, but the best that I can come up with is that in object-oriented programming, the solution has to look like the problem. And in particular, the entities uh, that define that problem always define the abstraction frontier. What does this mean? Well, think of a car. In the object-oriented programming, the car defines the abstraction frontier such that all the, the things that are outside of the car, they know nothing about the internals of the car. And all the things that are inside the car, they know everything about the internals of the car. Now, you can have object composition as long as the things that are inside of the car have their own abstraction uh, border. But, for instance, an encapsulated object aggregation would no longer really be object-oriented programming. Also, uh, this is still true even if you have getters and setters, because this is like a very thin wrapper around your objects that doesn't really abstract much. So it's kind of, you are faking that you have object-oriented programming without really having it. Another example of something that wouldn't be object-oriented would be something like share encapsulation. So that's something like slices. Several slices can point to the same internal data. 
Slices are great, but they aren't object-oriented. But they are great. But they aren't object-oriented. But they are great. So you say, who cares? I mean, maybe the car is an object-oriented object, and the others are just the classes and objects. Why does this matter? Why should I be concerned with this? The problem is that if you read the books about how you should go about designing your programs, they say that this is beautiful and they love it. And the alternative? Ugh, barf. They hate it. And I think this is a dogma. Let me explain you why with an example. Suppose you are programming this very complicated algorithm, and you are like, you can't even stand to look at it, it's so complicated. So you take some time, and you rewrite it as this beautiful chain of ranges and algorithms, and everything is so beautifully encapsulated, and you are like, ah, oh, I'm in love. Ah, oh, this is so beautiful, I'm going to print it and put it on the wall. But the world is so imperfect, and a change of requirements comes. For me, it generally comes very early, because sometimes indeed you don't have the best debuggers, and I do printf debugging. And all, what often ends up happening is that, okay, I want to check that something that is inside here makes sense with something that is in, inside here. And then I'm like, ah, oh, this is so inconvenient. And I'm like, ah, oh, can't I go back to this? So what's the conclusion? I love ranges and algorithms, but we can't conclude that there is always an abstraction frontier that makes sense for everything. You have to think what you want to compute, what you want to abstract away. But they always want that abstraction frontier. I think that we have three dogmas here that one entity, these are the classes in your domain, like player and game and things like that, always equals one class, and that you always abstract along entity lines, and that you always act from inside the frontier, that you have member methods. Let me give you an example. Say that you have an athlete class, and you have a, a run method, and you want to count the laps that your athlete has completed, but you want to reuse an existing lap counter service. Should it write inside your methods and change your member variable? Not very clean. Uh, you can have getters and setters, but it doesn't really change much. You aren't actually achieving a very good encapsulation. But you can have other alternatives. So for instance, the lap counter service can have its own table of how many laps each athlete has completed. And notice here that you don't say, how dare you? How dare you count the number of laps that I have completed? You are violating my encapsulation. At least not in the real world. But in programming, if you start maintaining a state of your object somewhere else, people will often say that. But it's pointless. Not everything that is related to a concept always belongs inside of the class that models that concept. And this might also be more practical. Imagine that, for instance, you want to have some statistics about the laps of the different athletes. What do you think is going to be more convenient and more performant? Go over a table, sequentially in memory, of which athletes have how many laps, or run around in the object ref of all of the athletes and maybe some other things, collecting the laps from each of those objects. It's going to be much cleaner and faster to go over this table. Now, suppose you don't just think I'm a crazy guy with some loony theories, and you say, I'm going to try what Louise was saying. And here, where I had these two different entities, these are separate classes, I used to have these polymorphic methods called transmogrify. I want to use an external service, my transmogrifier service. And of course, to transmogrify these entities, you are going to, be, to have to dispatch based on the entity type. The question then is, how do you do this? In the transmogrifier, how do you know how to transmogrify entity one and entity two, which might have a completely different structure? Well, 
you could do something like a visitor pattern. But the visitor pattern has a lot of problems, and you can ask Jean-Louis all about them in the next talk. If you read the article that Scott Myers wrote about uh, member and non-member functions that I talked about earlier, uh, he has an algorithm for deciding what should be a member function, what shouldn't be. And he says, if the function needs to be virtual, basically just give, give up. Put it as a member function. So should we give up? No, because in D, we have Jean-Louis Open Methods Library, and we can actually dispatch based on these entity types here uh, inside the transmogrifier. So these two open methods on, on, on the bottom, uh, they are specializations of our open transmogrify methods that dispatch based, based on the a virtual entity type. So you can have this external transmogrification service without the entity objects knowing anything about what a transmogrification is. Uh, so let's go over how we can start using this style. So this would be the usual orthodox object-oriented way of doing things. You have a class A and you have a member methods called foo. And you call it with the usual syntax. But now suppose that foo only uses the public interface of the class A. Why should it be a member method? If you put it on a separate module, you'll be sure that you won't be using by mistake any of the private implementation details of A. And using the unified function calling syntax, you can actually use it the usual way, uh, as if nothing had been changed, but now you have increased encapsulation. Now imagine that uh, foo doesn't just take a specific A, but it is generic, so it can work with any type that is structurally compatible with what foo expects. And this is interesting because foo uh, is now much more useful because it works with any compatible type. But then you can ask, uh, if you wanted to go back and put foo inside of the class in the way that object-oriented programming suggests you should do, to what class does foo now belong? Because it works with all of the classes. Uh, so you see, this is a much more generic way to do, but it only works uh, at compile time because you have to know what the exact type T is that you are going to work on. So uh, if that information is only available at runtime, you can't use uh, a template function. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if at the runtime, you can use an open method, which is basically just the counterpart of the uh, template function. It's the counterpart of a design that uses a generic or designed by introspection approach. So in general, uh, open methods are a superset of the regular member methods because you can do everything that the member methods do and more. OK, so this is the theory. Uh, the part uh, where I apply this, let me tell you about it. So there is this application called Logisim, and it's a great educational application. And fortunately, it's no longer maintained. And I don't want to maintain it because it has this very confusing Java object-oriented <laughs> architecture. Its simulation performance, it's not very good, and I don't really like non-native user interfaces <laughs> in any case. So I decided to uh, build my own. And it has some improvements upon Logisim. So it has better multivalued logic support. It has a better timing model support and several other features. The user can also export the circuit designs uh, to uh, the usual hardware design languages like Verilog so that it can be run on FPGAs. Uh, and the plan is to have a JIT accelerator for the simulator and native UI. Uh, so how should I go about designing this application? If I were to follow uh, the orthodox object-oriented approach, then 
I would follow a very specific process. So this book here, it's very interesting that one of the earlier chapters starts out with a discussion of how a very similar product uh, was designed by go talking with the experts and, and drawing these UML diagrams. Uh, so the, the discussion goes something like this. Well, you have these chips, and these chips have these nets with these, basically these wires, and they are going to have to send these signals over the nets to the other chips. Uh, well, actually, it was a component instance that has the pins, and the nets have a topology, and we are going to have this complicated process where the signals go over the pins, and the components push the signal, and uh, the component gets the pushes from a pin, and something, 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 and in the end, they produce this UML diagram for a problem that is very similar to the one I'm just about to discuss in my application. And I look at this I'm, and I'm thinking, this is a model of the problem. Why should I assume in any way that this is a straightforward solution to solve the problem? Why should I assume that this represents a good algorithm for computing the solution? It's not in any way obvious to me things like, why am I assuming that the component type stores the pushes from a specific pin number, maybe that's a very inconvenient way of implementing this. So if I looked at my application, and I, the usual object-oriented object way of doing this would be that I think about the classes. So I have classes like circuit, component, pin, wires, values, things like that. And I would have to start thinking about all of the responsibilities of those objects and how they interrelate to each other. But I didn't do that. Instead, I started thinking, what computation do I have to perform? So this is kind of a revisionist history, like when the one where they take you out of the photo if you, don't mis if you misbehave. But it's kind of a simplified version of how I actually designed thing this application. So I, I consider, what's the simple example I can think? Well, here you have a constant and a not gate. So the not gate computes that the output is just a negation of the input. So if this is the problem that I wanted to solve, this straightforward code would compute it. I was just thinking about the computation, not the classes yet. What if my circuit was more complicated? Well, the same solution still applies. But of course, I don't know what circuits the, uh, the users of the application are going to draw. So I can't assume any specific sequence of code. So how do I generalize this? Well. In the general case, it seems that we are always going to have some amount of states, and the components are going to update bits in that state. So why can't we use that? We have an array of bools, which is our states, and the component instances have some way of pointing to which part of the circuit they are reading their inputs and updating their outputs. Well, the problem is that in this simulation, this isn't really dealing with values like true and false just. The, the outputs of the gates, they have a strength. So for instance, if you output a value with no strength, the output is floating, it has an undefined value. If you output it with a weak strength, it can be overwritten by a stronger component. And uh, how can I uh, change my design to accommodate this? Well, I just, instead of using an array of pools, use an array of some struct value, which uh, has a, is a very simple abstraction over that flexibility of representing all of the different states. But this wasn't the only problem. So for instance, here we have an AND gate that is connected to some input value and the negation of that input value. So it would seem that the output is always going to be zero because if the input is true, the negation is false. So one of the inputs were always going to be false. But if you run the simulation in this special, very slow mode, what you see is that in these so-called delta cycles, there is a moment where the output is actually one. And that's because we have these propagation delays. So as one of the inputs is propagated faster than the other, for a brief moment, the end gate sees both inputs are true and outputs true. 
And this might have consequence for the rest of the circuit, so we have to model this. So I thought, OK, uh, can't I use this, this design to uh, and solve that problem? At first glance, it would seem so, as long as you correctly order uh, the rights for the updates to your circuits. So you go over the inputs, and you uh, match with the previous input in a way that you never override information that you, ha you haven't correctly updated. But then I thought, oh, if you have a loop, there is always going to be a case where you uh, have a dependency that you are going to lose some information. So why can't I keep track of the previous states in the previous delta cycles? Instead of having one value, I have two values, the states in this delta cycle and in the previous delta cycle. So for instance here, uh, I start with an input of zero, and if I change the input to be a one, the not gate doesn't immediately update because it sees that in the previous delta cycle, the input was still zero. Only once a bit more time has elapsed does the, output, does the not gate start outputting uh, the zero, the negation of the input, and only does in the next delta cycle the whole, the whole thing stabilizes. So that would seem to solve the problem. But there were another further problems. For instance, consider this circuit here. It has a not gate and it has a sub circuit. And if you actually look at the sub circuit, this is actually just another not gate. So conceptually, you are dealing with this sub circuit here where you have two not gates. So uh, this shouldn't be in any way a problem. Uh, the, the gates are redundant and they should output the usual value. But what you actually see is that if you simulate this in Logisim, for a brief instant, you have this error value where the gates are in a short circuit state. And that's because uh, these input and output pins to the sub-circuit were modeled in a way that they introduce an, ad an additional delta cycle of delay. And this, as an educational application, this wasn't very good because the input pin should just be behave like a wire, and if the wire isn't introducing any further delay, the input uh, shouldn't introduce it either. But it wasn't very clear how I should solve this because uh, the semantics is that I had two not gates, but the actual component tree in memory was this one. And with this structure, it wasn't very easy to solve the problem of not introducing the delays. So what were my options? Should I keep two different representations? That could be, make things a little bit more complicated. So I thought maybe I should introduce some kind of execution priority so that when an input comes to the input gate, the input goes, runs along very quickly and pushes the values out to the actual components in the sub-circuits, so things, things always update on time. But this actually also introduced some complexity in the design. Furthermore, there was another issue that this design didn't really solve in a very clean manner. Here I have two input gates and an output gate, and the input gates are joined by a wire. Now suppose that I change one of the input uh, uh, ports to, from a 0 to a 1, and I have to combine the value because they join the wire of the 0 and the 1, and this is supposed to be some kind of error state. Uh, it's technical, technically called forcing an unknown, an undefined value. And this is easy to do. You combine a zero and a one in the wire, and you get the error state. But the problem is that when you switch that input port back to a zero, if you just look at the zero and the error state in the wire, it's not very clear to which value you should go back. You, can, you can't undo that you are in this indefinite state without looking at all of the other inputs, which that design didn't make it easy. So, to solve that, I introduced a further abstraction, which I called signal, which maintained this notion of what is the current value in a wire and what uh, drivers are uh, collaborating to jointly produce that value. So for instance, here, I have a constant one that is going over two components. One component is inverting uh, the value from a 1 to a 0, and the other one is letting it pass on unmodified. And when I join these wires, what I do is that I 
changes from being one, two signals with one driver each to being one signal with two drivers, and this solves the problem of combining and then combining the values, and it actually also solves the problem of correctly uh, letting the signals propagate with the correct timings, because now here the same signal is referenced from inside of the sub-circuit, so this additional layer of indirection solved the problems, uh, and this is basically the design that I had in the end. And you'll notice that with the right at our design, by thinking about the computation that we wanted to perform, and we didn't have to introduce all of these very complex abstractions that might not be uh, in very convenient to the way that we solve the problem. We only abstracted what we actually needed to abstract. Now, at this point, you might say, that's concerning, because you haven't really thought through the problem and all of the consequence. You have just considered a few examples. So if something changes, you might have to uh, change your design in, in, a, in some kind of way, and your encapsulation isn't going to be very good. But actually, we improve the encapsulation over the typical way of do, doing things. So for instance, if you look at the LogiSim architecture, you'll see that the components, uh, they have to know a lot of stuff. They know the simulation state of each component. Uh, they know their location and they have responsibilities that they are going to create the components, simulate them, draw them, know where they are. While in our case, the component class only has a single responsibility, which is to maintain the simulation state. How then do we know how to actually do anything with the components? How do we know how to simulate them, how to draw them, how do we even know where to draw them? Well, the answer is that, let's go back, step back a little bit. This is the orthodox and the logism way of doing, where we have a single uh, class. If following the object-oriented approach, we wanted to uh, further decompose these, we might have, for instance, two classes. One only knows about simulating the end gate, and the other knows about the graphical representation, so we have an improved encapsulation. But we have to maintain the separate hierarchy of types, so it's the simulation end gate and the graphical end gate. It's the simulation register and the graphical end register. And in our case, uh, we have only one type, and the other responsibilities, they are open methods that know how to operate upon that type. And we know where that component is laid out in the document to another a class, which I call the, a document component. And uh, this isn't a type that we have to vary based on the component that is uh, being uh, stored in the doc component. So, for instance, he, this is how you, you would draw uh, the in, intermediate solution here with the end gate and end gate graphical user interface. You get a reference to the components a graphical user interface and you ask it to draw. In our case, uh, you go fetch the component that is stored inside of the doc component and you call the open method draw that is virtual in terms of the component and not the doc component. Uh, what ends up happening is that in my application, I have three main packages. The simulation package only knows about simulation. The document package knows about uh, where in the document uh, the various uh, components are geometrically, how much space they take and which lines join each other. And it has a dependency on the simulation and the graphical interface uh, knows how to actually draw the components based on their locations, and it has to know about both the document and, and the simulation state. Uh, so you see that, in my case, I have these abstraction frontiers that aren't really drawn across entity lines. F so for instance, two of the most important abstraction frontiers are to separate the simulation from the document layout, so that the simulation doesn't have to know anything about the document layout. Although life is complicated and sometimes we have to get information from both domains, such as, for instance, for drawing things. 
One issue that you also have often in object-oriented programming uh, is that you have all of these very complicated object graphs. So consider a game. We have things like a game class, a player class, and the player might have a gun, and the gun has ammunition. And for instance, maybe the ammunition has to request something, some kind of service from the game to be able to perform its function. But there is this uh, principle uh, that is called the law of the meter which says that you shouldn't go through all of these in, in directions. So if the ammunition wants to request something, for instance, from the game, it should actually have a reference to the game. But this isn't really good for performance because it is going to pollute our caches and will have an impact on performance. So we actually had this problem in our digital logic simulator application because we have things like the simulation, the circuit, the circuit instance, and then the component instance. And conceptually, you need to have all of these references between the, these objects. But you don't actually want to maintain them in memory because it's going to uh, have an impact on performance. So what we can do here is that at the point of, for instance, simulation, we, you pass the references that you actually need, and you don't have to store them as these very complicated object graphs. You only store the data in memory uh, in a way that actually makes sense for the computation you want to perform. Uh, let me skip over a few slides. Let me just, to finish, talk about testing. Uh, you know, for instance, last year uh, I used the uh, Empire game uh, in my demo. It was just a convenience, and I didn't. I wanted to do some cleanup of, of the the game before I used it, uh, so I wanted to refactor it. Um, but this application had no tests, and so this uh, this would be considered legacy code f by Michael Feathers, which is basically code that doesn't have any tests. So ideally, I would have to create tests for everything that I was going to change. Like Walter said, we, have to, we are going to have a test suite if we are going to make changes, right? But this would be a lot of work uh, to create all of these tests. So I came up with a smarter alternative. I set up various games with no graphical user interface, and I recorded all of the messages of the game and the map state, and I played the entire game very quickly. And in, the, all of these uh, messages in map state is hashed into a buffer. And what I do is that when I want to refactor some piece of code, I checked with the code coverage that that code is covered by the test that I ran. And only then, if it is covered, do I refactor. After refactoring, I run the whole test again, and I compare the hash, and I check that they match, and I didn't introduce any states in the games that were played. And surprisingly, this worked amazingly well, because even though we were integrating and testing the whole application, I could do this very fast, and it actually was very effective. I didn't introduce any, any bugs that I, I could check later. So with this uh, insight in mind, when I decided to test my simulations, the usual way of doing this is that I would have tests for things like the simulation that wouldn't involve the rest of the application. But what I realized was that if I wanted to uh, write out these tests, these test cases were very verbose because I had to write out instantiation of all of the components, what were the connections. This was a lot of effort. So I decided that let's scrap all of that. Let's test the application as much more of a whole. So I would design a circuit in the graphical user interface. I would save it to a file, read the file in the test, simulate, and assert I had the correct results. And this worked very well, which was very surprising and goes against the orthodox advice that you should have much more localized unit tests. But you have to be careful about how you do this. Um, so basically, it was great programming with open methods, and I think it's an option that we should con consider, and you shouldn't take uh, uh, the standard way of doing things as a dogma. You should actually think about what you want to do in your application and which solution best, best achieves the goals that you want to achieve. Thank you. Well, that was sudden. All right. We have questions. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. I like to say that uh, free functions